as possible. Um, so just keep that in mind. We'll try to get to as many questions as we can, and we'll get to show on the road here in a second. I'm going to hand the mic off to the judge, and uh, thank you all again for having us. Proud of all of you coming out this morning. We really appreciate it. We are so honored today to have Governor Bavin in Ohio County. I am always so impressed with his knowledge of the issues facing Kentucky and his willingness to tackle our problems. Governor Bevin always is mindful of the difficulties facing rural communities and specifically Ohio County. It is my pleasure to present our Governor, Matt Bevin. Got the part where I'm six four, good looking, great head of hair. I got all that. I guess my, I didn't write that part down. I'm gonna actually put this away, uh, if that's all right. Can you guys hear me? Okay. I've got nine kids, so I'm used to projecting a little bit, and it sounds like there's a microphone picking something up here anyway. Uh, so hopefully you all can hear me uh, pretty well. The point of these events is really to answer whatever questions you want, and you can certainly feel free. If somebody has to get up and go, people have to come and go. There's people who come into these because they only got 15 minutes or something, and they, people come late and leave early. If you have to get up and go somewhere, don't feel trapped. I mean, don't feel like, well, gee, it would be rude if I got up and moved out. This is your time. This is your forum. The whole point of this is to talk about what you want. You tell me what you want me to know. I answer to the best of my ability questions that you have or try to find answers for it after the fact. I want to introduce to you a couple of folks. Rebecca, if you could uh, stand up for a moment. Rebecca Rittenhouse is our local community representative for this region for Department of Local Government. Uh, and Rebecca has been, hopefully most of you know who she is already. If not, and you have questions about what role Frankfurt can have in this community, whether you're with an ad or whether with the health department or whatever the case might be, Rebecca is a good initial point of contact. So. Thank you, Rebecca, uh, for being here as well. You know, this is, I feel a little bit like a, a Baptist preacher in a country. I mean, everybody's sitting in the back here. You're afraid there's going to be an altar call or something. I won't do that to you. So if you want to move up, you can do it. Uh, if you got to get up and leave, go for it. Uh, and let's just open it up. I, I could sit here and give you a little speech. You don't need a speech. None of us want to listen to me give a speech, including me. So why don't we just talk about what you want to talk about? Questions, comments, thoughts? Let me say this before we get started. I know one of the biggest issues people often have concerns about is infrastructure. And I, I think we've talked, where did the judge go? I, I, hopeful, I don't know if you've even gotten this word yet. Uh, we've got folks from our transportation cabinet that are here as well. Uh, and I hope you have come to appreciate this transportation cabinet operates very differently than it used to work in Kentucky. Historically, it was a function of whether your judge executive knew the right person in Frankfurt or something like that. It doesn't work that way anymore. It doesn't matter whether it's a Republican county or Democrat county in terms of its elected leadership, it doesn't matter. We look at the prioritization of projects based on need, based on safety, based on economic impact. We rank them across the state. And so we put a lot of money into counties that didn't seem to be supportive politically, but who cares? I just want you to understand that to me, the politics of it should not exist. If a road project or other infrastructure project needs to be done, is worthy of being done, it should be done, period. And so to that end, there's an announcement that I want to make here, and maybe you're already aware of it, but I'm not sure that we've even made this announcement yet is that we've got some discretionary funds that we are able to use for projects that are elevated on the need front. And in this community, there's three such projects. Weedman Loop is one, Newcut Road is one, uh, Arnold Leach uh, Road is another one. Those are three roads that we're going to be uh, releasing about $350,000 uh, to bituminously top those and resurface those roads. And so this is something that will be coming. When's, when are we expecting to see this kick off? In springtime, I guess? Spring paving season. Yeah, once the paving season opens up. So pretty early on in the season, though. Yes? Yeah. So good. So these, though, just FYI and, and, and expect, again, you're welcome, but, you know, heck, it's, it's your all's money, so you don't need to thank us for it. We're just giving you your own money back. So that's the way it works. All these dollars are our own money. Every single thing, everyone who came here today 
came here wanting something or needing something from government, I'm guessing. Maybe you just were curious about what this conversation would be about. But all of us need certain things from government. We all have uh, certain things that we expect from government. But 100% of all those things are funded with our own money. It's our money. We literally take it out of this pocket, send a portion of it into the government in the form of taxes or fees or you know excise you know charges or whatever, and then it comes back to us. So it's our own money. And this is why, and I say with all due respect to me, to your judge and everyone else, you never have to thank an elected official for helping you with get your own money back. That's our job. That is our job. Expect us to do it. So questions on anything, <clears throat> and including, and then I really will let you ask these questions. Don't, don't come up to me afterwards, please, and say, hey, you know, I didn't want to bring this up because I thought it might be a tough question. I didn't want to ask that in front of everybody. Those are the exact questions I would like. There's no question that I'm not willing to take. The, if it's on your mind and you think it needs to be addressed, I guarantee you other people in here feel the same way. So I don't care what it is. Yes, ma'am. Anything at all, I'm happy to take. Yes, ma'am. Uh, first of all, Governor, uh, I'm Charlotte Whitaker. I'm president of AARP Kentucky, and I'm from Ohio County, and we appreciate you coming to our county. You're welcome, Charlotte. Um, and uh, we do have a lot of needs here. Uh, I represent almost a half million members across the Commonwealth, and uh, there's a lot of needs with our 50-plus, as you well know. Uh, one of I'm one of them now, so I don't know <laughs> at what point I have been for a while now, actually. Uh, the one I want to address, uh, it's very dear to my heart here, um, is the home, in home services. If I were to call Brad today and put a, a loved one on the meal program, I would get told it's a two year wait. And what's happening, that person either dies waiting or they go in long term care on Medicaid, costing our state thousands of dollars. Uh, and basically, it costs about fifteen hundred to fund a meal for a senior in Ohio County. And so, uh, when you're giving out that money, if you could give us some more money for our in-home services, we'd really appreciate it. Last month, we dedicated seventy-five beautiful new uh, low-income apartments for our fifty-five and over, thanks to Kentucky Housing. They are just a great partner to work with, and we appreciate them. But having said that, uh, they're full with a new waiting list. But three people have come out of long-term care off the roads of Medicaid to those apartments because uh, they're hearing impaired, there's vision impaired, and they meet their needs. So that's a good thing, you know, that we are able to bring those people out of the long-term care and into a livable community where they want to be. So those are just, there's lots of needs here, as you well know. On a personal note, uh, I have to, be the, have to be the mother of two Kentucky State Troopers, and we thank you for the, your support of the KSP. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for raising two uh, individuals who have become Kentucky State Troopers. <coughs> so, I mean, really and truly, you think about it, the people serve this community in a lot of ways. We have teachers serving in classrooms. We have highway, you know, workers out on the roads driving trucks during icy weather serving. We have Kentucky State Troopers that are serving. We have people in our corrections officers and social workers and a whole lot of things. A lot of people from a lot of angles serve us. It's a single digit number of people in those roles. And 90-some percent of the rest of us who benefit from that in some respect. So thank you for your family's contribution to that. One thing I'll clarify as it relates to, I know you were only half joking and saying if we have some extra money to hand out, but understand this, those road dollars that are being used for these three projects I just mentioned, those are monies that come from the variable excise tax on fuel. It's, a, it's something we already pay. It's monies that are part of a 9% excise tax on the gross amount of, of the cost when you fill up your gas tank. It's a tax that has existed. It was a floor. You often hear about things being capped. There was a floor put in it two, three, four years ago now. And until gas gets up to about 285, 290, 95, three bucks a gallon, we're not going to be above that floor. So it's, it's bittersweet that gas is cheap. That's the sweet part, you know, for those of us that use it. Uh, the bitter part of that is that means the amount of monies coming in through that as a revenue source to be used in infrastructure projects is not going to be going up. So this is a conundrum we have. As it relates to your specific point about uh, housing, about the needs for those of long-term and assisted living and other types of housing, 
All of these things, as we said earlier, cost money. And where does the money come from? It comes from us. So every dollar we spend in, whether it's a road, whether it's housing, or whether it's a equipment for state troopers and or pay increases for people or whatever, every dollar that goes fixing the pension system, I'm sure nobody here has heard that there's a pension conversation. <coughs> I'm sure that's never been on anybody's radar screen. We can come to that in a moment if you want to. But every dollar that goes into any one of these things that I've just mentioned, is a dollar that comes from somewhere else at the end of the day. There's only so many dollars, and so if we want a dollar for this, that means someone else doesn't get the dollar. What other things would you like to address? Yes, sir. My name is Bill Burden. Uh, I'm co-chair of the Rosine Association. We promote bluegrass music in, uh, in Rosine. And, uh, I just wanted to ask you uh, what the dollars are going to be available for the tourism here. Specifically, the dollars for tourism in this county coming from the state, I don't have an answer for you on, except to say this. We are spending more than we ever have in Kentucky on upgrading our state parks, drawing attention to very, the very programs like the one Rosine and others, making sure people are aware of the incredible array of things that we have, traditional tourism, something that's now increasingly called ecotourism that takes advantage of just our beautiful landscape and natural ravines, riverways, rock walls and things. And also just things that people think of when they think of, well, horse farms and bourbon trails and things of that sort. You know, the Bill Monroe Museum and things of this sort are known within certain circles. You know, the Everly Brothers are known to certain people. But how do we, in East, West and everywhere in between, do a good job as a state of promoting these. Right now, for those of you that happen to, to watch TV and watch cooking shows, Top Chef is a popular show. It's focused on Kentucky right now. Millions and millions and millions of people, tens of millions of people, will watch that show and have a very different perception of who we are and what's available here in Kentucky simply based on the stories that are told in and around that food show. So these are things we're focusing on. You didn't ask specifically about state parks, but they're not unrelated to what you did ask about. And again, my point is, I don't know, there's no pre-designated amount of money coming to Rosie. But the point is, money is coming that's going to make its way into this community. And the state parks, for example, in the 10-year period prior to, to this administration coming in, and, I, and let me just say this. this is, the point of this isn't to be political, but I will say to you all, this is, this is the first political job I've ever had. So to those of you that were part of, of giving me this opportunity, thank you. If you weren't, you know, the one thing I've come to find out, once you're actually the governor, everybody says they voted for you. So thank you, since I'm sure all of you voted for me. But whether you did or didn't, the reason I mention this is, thank you for giving me the opportunity. Because it gives me the opportunity, as a person who's never been in politics, to bring business-minded thinking. Business isn't government, government isn't business. You can't operate one like you operate the other. But you can bring business-minded principles to government. And to this end, including on what we do with tourism, this is how I think. And the people we put in place, one of the things that bothered me, we have like 50 state parks, and they're beautiful, and they're stunning. They're as fine as any state park system anywhere in America but they've been allowed to fall into sort of a dilapidated state of disrepair. And in 10 years, from 2005 to 2015, the 10 years that preceded me, I just looked at that snapshot, guess how much money we spent? I've seen two different numbers, but guess how much money we spent in total for 50 state parks for 10 years, that's 500 years worth of maintenance and upkeep, new mattresses, paint, you know, cement, railing systems, electrical systems, everything, anything associated with maintaining or upkeeping these parks. 500 years worth of maintenance. What do you suppose as a state we put into that for that whole period? It was either, it's, it was somewhere between six and seven point eight million dollars. <coughs> somewhere between six and eight million bucks. Which is about hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars a year per state park. Crazy. It was basically they were disregarded. How many of y'all have ever been to Lake Barkley and the beautiful 
you know, one of the most stunning lodges in beauty. You walk in there, it's just stunning, the lake's out there. It was built in 1970. It's being repainted right now. It's underway, it has been, it may even be complete by now. Beautiful, stunning. It was built in 1970. Guess when the last time that it was repainted? 1970. Hasn't been painted one time since it was built. That's crazy. These are the kind of things, to the heart of your question, how do we take advantage of who we are and what we have? Our music, the beauty of our scenery, these incredible gems that are our state parks. We put in, again, six to eight million in the previous 10 years. We put in 18 million in the first two years, another $20 million being put in right now. So close to 40 million in this first term into our state parks, that's still not enough. There's about 200 and some million dollars worth of deferred maintenance. But that 40 million has made a profound difference. For any of you who go to these places, just over the last couple of years, we've seen the number of room nights go up 18,000. 18,000 more people stayed in one of our state parks last year than they did just a couple of years ago. Why? Because they're having a better user experience. And when they come to one of our state parks, they're more likely to stay longer if they have a good experience. They're going to go out and say, what else is in this community? We're going to make them more aware of the very kind of things offered in Rosine and other places. And it becomes this ripple effect. The wonderful thing is, too, they're not only staying there and staying there more often, they're on average spending $11 more per night than they were, and they're happy to do it. They're getting a better experience, they're paying more money, they're spending more time in the communities. All that is good for communities like this. So I guess I would ask of you, before we part ways, let me make sure that you get with Rebecca and, and, and tell her how, what are we missing? What are we as a state not doing a good enough job about elevating? Because let me just say this one thing, we'll get to the next question here. Look at who we are in this state. Look at what we have. I say this with all respect to every other state. You probably can tell just by even listening to my accent or lack of an accent. I didn't grow up in Kentucky. I've lived here most of my adult life, 20 some years, 20, a little over 20 years. I came here on purpose. I first lived here, I came here 30 years ago and when I was in the military and stationed at Fort Knox for a while. But I said, boy, if I could ever come back and live in a community like this, I'd love to. Live in a state like this, the values, the quality of life, the ease of living, four seasons, none of them are typically too extreme. A little ice every now and then, but nothing like you have a little north of us. A little heat every now and then, but nothing like you have just a little south of us. Green rolling fields, arable land, potable water, riverways, roadways, railways, logistical hubs and airports, the likes of this, this doesn't exist in other places. I've been in 49 of the 50 states on the ground, working, living, spending time, I once rode my bicycle across the United States from one end to the other, 3,800 miles. I've seen America in slow motion, literally. I took my kids out of school uh, seven years ago now, and we drove 26,000 miles around America for a year, my wife and I, and visited 40-something different states at that time. I've seen a lot of America, and I'm telling you, I'm not just blowing smoke because we're in Kentucky and we are Kentucky. But there is no state that pound for pound has the diversity, the beautiful topography, and the resources, and the upside potential that we have. There is not. There are others that have some variations of it, but nobody has what we have. The key, though, is how do we take advantage of it? Somebody asked me, again, I wasn't born here, I didn't grow up here. I'm here on purpose. There's a lot of people in America and in the world looking for a place like this. And when they find it, they're amazed. And they stay here for generations. It's interesting, I was asked one time, you know, what would it be success? Like when I'm done, what do I hope that people say about this administration? What would success look like? And it kind of comes back to the heart of some of these questions we've been asking. I want, I want the next generations of kids to be able to stay here. I want the governor of Tennessee and of Texas and of North Carolina or wherever I want them to wonder why their kids have to go to Kentucky to get a job instead of the other way around. 
We hear plenty of the other. Yes, sir. How you doing? I'm John Bennett. I'm an attorney. Law firm across the street. We'll try not to hold that against you. I'm just, I'm just kidding. Well, I want to commend you on the felony expungement statute that you enacted. But I'd submit to you that it's not enough, and then we're seeing a very small percentage because of the way that the language has been interpreted. And I'd like to know if there's going to be an expansion on that or to clean that language up because there's a lot of the, the way it's written right now is a single felony can be expunged, and that includes that means just one, even if there's a set of transactions within a single indictment. And these people, some of them are being reformed and asking, hey, can I get this off my record? And we try to do it, and we can't because of the way the law is interpreted. So I'd like to ask you if there's going to be plans to expand or clarify that language to make expungement more accessible. Sure, it's a good question, uh, and because he was in the back of the room, I think you all heard the question, hopefully. Uh, it's a question about expungement. We did pass a bill right after I was elected. This is something, I'm a big believer in second chances and opportunities for people. I really am. This is the nature, this is who we are in America. America is a land of second chances and opportunity. Give people a chance to get their life back. There shouldn't be second and third class citizens based on mistakes that people have made. If a person has paid their dues, they've paid their restitution, They've done what's expected of them. They're living a law-abiding life. Why should they be kept in some permanent second-class status? It doesn't make sense. But as you can appreciate, this was the reason it was never done. You never had a governor that was willing to lead on it because it's frankly, it's not a political winner. But I don't do things. If you haven't figured this out by now, I don't pick topics that are political winners. I don't. I do them because they need to be done. And this was a good example of it. You know, is that we need to find a way to bring the hundreds of thousands of Kentuckians who this applies to back into mainstream. We need them economically, civically, and otherwise. So the reason we did that is because as a governor, I was able to convince people in, in my party who had often been the breaking mechanism. The other party had often said, hey, we should be for it, but it never, when they were in charge, actually did anything about it. So there was a lot of talk on one side, a lot of resistance on the other, and nobody actually doing anything. So I did get these folks together, and I led on this to be able to get done what we've done. And you're right, it's only a first few steps down a fairly lengthy path. Could we do more? Yes. Should we do more? Yes. But in fairness, it was not easy to even get that done, ironically. And so we are in the process of digesting it. You said it only applies to a number of folks, and that's true. We've had about, these are rough numbers, about 1,500 people who have actually applied to have their record expunged. More than 1,000 of them have already had their record expunged. There's about 400 and some odd, whatever the difference of the 1,500-ish is, that are pending. Nobody's been rejected. Anybody who actually qualifies gets their record expunged. It's just a matter of time. But that's 1,500 out of 20 times that. I don't know the total number of people who have a felony conviction. You might know, but it's many times that number that have applied. Some will never apply. They don't care. And that's okay. They may care, but they don't care enough to do something. But there are many who do. It isn't just that it was a single. It was that certain classes of felonies aren't even eligible. And that's, again, because in order to get this passed, there had to be some give and take. Some people didn't like it at all. Others wanted it to be everything. And so it ended up being something in the middle. That's the, how the sausage gets made in Frankfurt and appropriately. But as we move down this path, and as the sky does not fall, and it's not, we're not becoming unsafe, people aren't out there doing bad things. As this starts to be proven to be valuable to our communities, I think you'll start to see more things. One thing I would like to see, I really would, but this is going to require two things, three things actually. It's going to require actually two primary things. I would like to see us be a state where a person who has met the requirement to pay whatever amount of time they need to be incarcerated and or on parole or and are on probation, to pay whatever restitution, to pay back whatever it is that they owe. If they've done that and are now no longer in any kind of trouble with the law, why shouldn't they automatically get their rights back? Seriously, why not? We are one of only a couple states where that's not at all possible. It's by our state constitution. 
So it's easy to say, well, we should just change that. This is how it has to be changed. The legislature, and I don't have any ability to, to start or stop this process, the legislature has to first vote to put this on the ballot. We're not a referendum state. You'll sometimes hear people say, well, let the people decide. Our state constitution works a little differently. Certain things have to be put on the ballot by the decision making of the legislature. So what I'd like to see, I'd like to see the legislature put this on the ballot. It would be in 2020. They'd have to then, if they voted, I don't get to say I'm for it, I don't get to veto, it doesn't ever come to my desk. The legislature, independent of the executive branch, makes a decision to put things on the ballot. When it is put on the ballot, they can only do up to four constitutional amendments in any one election cycle. They do it in even numbered years. So they could do it in 2020. Between now and 2020, they would vote to put this issue on the ballot if they chose to. If they did this, then that's step one. Then we, the people of Kentucky, get to vote. And we say we're for it or we're against it. That's the only way it changes. If we're for it, then automatically, in Kentucky, upon meeting these criteria that I mentioned earlier, you'd get them back. You wouldn't need to go through this process. I'd be happy to see it, I really would. Would there be some exceptions? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's up to how this thing is put on the ballot. But it's, it's a function of, there's several steps that have to happen for us to continue to make progress. I'd just like to respond. In an economic matter, there's a different thing between expungement and uh, restoring rights. I mean, they're two separate issues because Correct. The, the economical barrier is really the record itself as opposed to having your rights restored. Now, I, Correct. I would agree that it's important for people that have been through the justice system to be able to vote on things like judges who they've actually been in front of and their legislators and things like that. You know, but I'm talking, you could literally, through the process I just mentioned, literally have the expungement of records as well. You could. And that because, be because another issue is that felonies require a $500 filing fee, which yeah. a lot of these people but here's what I'll tell you. I mean, I hear that. And that may be true to a degree, but I'm not buying it. If you want your life back, and I say this with absolute respect, I grew up in poverty. I grew up well below the poverty level. I understand what it's like to be poor. I do. But it's also a function of priorities. And if you have been on the wrong side of the law for whatever reason, and you've paid your debt to society, and you want your full rights and responsibilities back, and you deserve that, great. $500 is a lot of money, I understand that. But it is not insurmountable. And some of these very same folks who do not have the money they would have us believe, some really don't. But I'll tell you, there are groups that will come alongside a person that is sincere and help them. There are individuals that will come alongside a person, including their employers, to help them with that. And some, when I hear a person who's got a, a brand new $500 tattoo telling me they don't have $500, it's hard for me to believe it. It's hard for me to believe it. That's not everybody. I'm not implying that's everybody. Even though somebody, if this was in a big town, you know, the newspaper would say, you know, Bevan says people with tattoos, you know, or whatever. I mean, they would misconstrue what I'm saying. You understand what I'm saying. People make choices every day as to how they spend their money. If, you, if, if, some, if I had the ability to get my life back for 500 bucks, I would find 500 bucks. I would. And I think others do, and they've done it. With respect to restoration of rights, I've done that for thousands and thousands of people. The 1,500 I'm talking about are people who've literally had their records expired. They're two different things. Yes, ma'am. Absorbed it one year, 
uh, in the future, it will be jobs, uh, especially in the Sheriff's Department. I think they'll be hit first. We will lose jobs. We can't even consider doing uh, CPI raises uh, because it's just not feasible. Sure. No, I, you're absolutely right. Guess what? This is, I, I, I knew we weren't going to be so fortunate to be able to not talk about pensions. This is critical. This affects every single local budget. It affects the county budget. It affects the state budget. You mentioned 20 some odd percent. The average in cities and counties is an increase of about 30 percent between the mix of hazard versus non-hazard versus, I mean, they're different rates. But on average in Kentucky, it's an increase of as much as about 30%. That's a crazy big increase. Like, where's the money going to come from, you're asking? And it's a good question. You know what it is for the state? It's already at 45%. It's going to 84%. For KSP, 145%. Every dollar I have to budget for Kentucky State Police, i got to come up with $1.45 on top of it just to meet an obligation for people that aren't even working anymore. So believe me, your pain, I'm feeling it three and four and five times as much, literally. The question you're saying is, well, well do people do this so that they can get more money? Not even a little. It has nothing to do with trying to get money. It has everything to do with saying, we've made a promise to people. We have promised people who work for this state that they will get a pension when they retire. We have a legal and a moral obligation to fulfill that promise. But we have been lying to people for decades about what they were going to get and how certain we were that we could deliver it to them. I ran for governor for two primary reasons. I put out a blueprint for better Kentucky. There were other reasons on there. But two primary reasons that I ran that motivated me to leave the private sector and run for public office was the pension issue and nobody addressing it, and I saw that it was gonna ruin this state financially because it was gonna come down to the question you just asked. We should have been having this conversation 20, 25 years ago, frankly, we should have. Because even when we thought we were fully funded, we weren't. We had demographic issues I'll get into in a moment. The other issue was adoption and foster care, also broken, has been for a long time. Those are the two things that motivated me. Four of my nine kids were adopted. I've had experiences with adopting out of the state foster care system that were what motivated me more than 10 years ago. I said, someday, somebody should do something about this. I never thought I'd be that person. There's a lot of things that need to be addressed. Back to pensions. I mean, I'm gonna, this isn't your question specifically, but I'm gonna try to explain some things that I hope will be helpful to you and to others in this room. How many in this room, before I even answer this, how many in this room either receive now or are working toward and hope to receive a pension from the state or have an immediate family member who does? Okay, outstanding. Probably half the people in this room. Okay, so this is going to be very germane to all of you that raised your hand. A defined benefit plan, the types that we have offered through the years, and they're in various forms, CERS, KERS, KERS non-hazardous, Got them for the state police, got legislative, got judicial, got a lot of different plans, but they're all backstopped by the same people, the taxpayers. They all come from the public, you know, the ability to fulfill that promise. When these plans were set up 50, 60, 70 years ago, defined benefit plans were not you put your money in and you get it back out. I hear people say that all the time, well, I put my money in, I better get my money out. We'll go through an example and help you understand how that's not how they work. A defined benefit plan works the way Social Security works, where the people that are down here are paying for the people up here that are retired. Yes, you're paying in, and yes, ultimately, some of what you'll get back is monies that have been yours and others pulled together, but in reality, it's the people down here that are paying for the people here. The very first people to ever retire the very first people in any one of our state plans or any federal plan or Social Security or any of these others that operate that way in the public sector, the very first ones to retire didn't put in for 20 or 30 years. They just got to retire and they got a benefit. And these people down here were paying for it because there were 25 or 30 of them down here at the bottom of the, of the pyramid. But then eventually that began to change as people got older. It became, you know, 20, then 15, and then... 12 and 10 and 8 and 6 and 4 and 3. How many of you have heard or believe 
that Social Security is in trouble in America. Pretty much everybody. If you're under the age of 50, which is not most of us in this room, but there are some, nobody under 50 thinks they're ever going to actually see it. And there are people over 50 who aren't convinced they're going to see it for their lifetimes. Everybody knows that it's broke. And yet Social Security still has in America right now, has three and a half people paying in down here for everyone that's retired. For everybody getting a Social Security benefit, there's still three and a half people that are paying in. So it still seemingly has a little life ahead of it. In Kentucky, and this has been happening for a long, long time, and we all know it, but nobody's been willing to talk about it. In Kentucky, we're not 10 anymore. We're not five anymore. We're not three and a half anymore. We're less than one. Less than one person working for every retiree. It has inverted. It's not a defined benefit plan anymore. It is financially, statistically, numerically, actuarially impossible for the system to be sustained based on the way the system was designed. Impossible. And anyone who tells you otherwise is either ignorant of the facts or they are lying to you. And this is what has been happening in this state for a long time. And so I have been bringing this up ever since I was elected, since before I was elected. It doesn't make people happy. It makes them uncomfortable. It makes them angry. I heard somebody say, I was doing this for political reasons. This was helping me politically. Really? Really? I, can any one of you explain? I mean, how much do you think this is helping me politically? I'm not sure how that would be. This is a very unpleasant topic of conversation. But the bottom line is we don't have the money that has been promised. So what can we do? You asked about, well, they, the KRS made these adjustments and they raised the rates. You know why? Those rates, they don't raise them or lower them based on anything other than actuarial reality. And it isn't a group of people who do it. It's, it's a, a byproduct of how much money do we have how much money do we owe? What do we expect the life expectancy of people to be? What kind of returns do we think we're gonna get on the monies in the marketplace? What kind of payroll growth or decline is contributing? All those factors together spit out a number that says if you don't put in at least X, you continue to get into worse condition. The fact that these rates are going up is a recognition of the fact that if we don't at least do that amount, the state will collapse, the pension plans will collapse even more than they have. And I hear people say, well, CERS, we're 50, 4, 5, 6% funded. We don't have the problem of KERS non-hazardous. KERS non-hazardous, I'm not even asking you to raise your hands again. You know if you're in the KERS non has plan. If you are, you should be very concerned. It's out of money. It's broke. Last year it ended with two point something billion dollars. It paid out a billion, took in a hundred million, and ended up with two billion. Do the math on that one. You have two billion dollars in change. You spend a billion every year. You bring in a hundred million. How many years you got? A couple. Two to three, depending on what kind of returns you get. And yet every governor before me, and most of the legislators before those in place now, have straight up lied to people and told you, oh, it's all good, don't worry, all the back, back taxpayers got you covered. They've lied to you. The money's not there. And CERS, which is 54, 5, 6% funded, said, well, we're not KERS non-hazardous. KERS non-hazardous is about 10 or 11, maybe 12% funded, maybe. It means for every dollar they owe, including to some of you who raised your hands, they have maybe 11 cents. The other 89 cents isn't there. You were promised it, you are owed it, true enough, legally as well, but it's literally not there, so where is it gonna come from? Doesn't matter if you've been promised something that there's no ability to back up, that's a problem. So I hear your question, and it's a good one, and I'm telling you, every county, every city is wrestling with this same problem right now. They don't have the money, there will be cuts. No question about it. Not because anyone wants it, not because we can even afford it. But we don't have any alternative. 
The reason rates are going up is because for the first time we're trying to be realistic, but let's be honest, even now, the numbers that it has gone up by aren't enough. We're still assuming rates of return in the marketplace that we're not getting. Up until last year, we were still assuming a 4% increase in payroll growth, even as it was going like this. We kept pretending it was going like that. It was ridiculous. The governors before me and the legislators before these who have not addressed it, shame on every one of them. They have, they have ridden herd on, intentionally or out of obliviousness, the worst funded pension system in America. And now, for those of us who find ourselves in elected office now, or at least while I'm here and can call people's attention to the truth, we're going to be realistic. I'm the only governor in the history of Kentucky that's ever even funded the ARC, ever, which is a crazy thing to me. And I'm the one that everybody hates, ironically. And I don't mean you, but I'm just saying many. And I don't mind that. Again, I didn't do this, I didn't address this topic to be loved. I'm the last governor that literally could have afforded to kick this down the road, especially if I wanted to serve for one term. The, three, the $5 billion that I've put into the pension systems, three in the last two years, that's $5 billion. Could you imagine if I'd done what the previous governors did? The last governor didn't put that much in in eight years. And in fact, many years he didn't even spend half of what was asked for in the ARC payment. But everybody loved him. Why? Because he spent all that money on other things. I could have done the same thing. Could you imagine how happy you'd be? Heck, I could build you, I wouldn't just have to put bituminous topping on, you know, new cut road. I could build you a, you know, newer cut road, you know, for the billions of dollars. I mean, think about it. Think about it. For, if I had an extra two billion, if I just took half of the money that we've put into the pension system to try to keep it from collapsing, for all of you who raised your hands, if I'd had two and a half billion dollars, my goodness, every one of your wish lists how much do you need, Judge? You need a couple few million here. Here you go. You're, you're going to be for me? Oh, yeah. That's the way it always worked. It shouldn't work that way. So we're paying our bills because the bill has come due. And I'm not going to, I don't need or want this job badly enough to lie to people about the truth in order to get or keep the job. I just don't. I really don't. Here's what's funny. Somebody said, well, you know, if you keep talking about these hard things, you might not get reelected. That may be true, the people will decide. Here's what I will tell you. Politically, does that, is that the end of my career? Yeah. For every other facet of my life, boom, everything gets so much better. Seriously. My ability to earn money, my quality of life, my control of my life. So I'm not doing this because I need a political job. This is the first one I've had. Hopefully be the last one I have. I'll do it with a sense of earnestness. I'll do it to the best of my ability. But I'm going to tell people the truth, and the truth is there is no relief for the question that you ask. There is none. And in fact, the numbers that you're being asked to do aren't enough. They're not. We have 160-something different quasi-organizations, uh, including some that might be represented in this room, some of which cross paths with you, health departments and things of this sort. They don't have the money. They have no money. They're going to go bankrupt. We have several counties that literally are borrowing money just to make the payments on their insurance. Counties. They are going bankrupt. And there is no money to backstop them. They will go bankrupt. Why are they going bankrupt? Because this problem has been ignored for so long. And without beating this completely to death, although we're doing this, I hope you're understanding what's at stake. Let me give you a couple quick examples. Super quick as to how we got here. People, how is this possible if we've been making CERS, ironically, is required by law to always meet the ARC. The other plans are not. CERS is, and yet CERS is less than 60% funded. So it's not simply a matter of whether or not you made the ARC payment. It's other things. It's this demographic reality. That's what's done. It. And we have promised people things that you can't back up. There, we have promised this high three and high five, enrolling sick days and vacation days, and using those toward compensation, taking 30% of the cash value and pretending that was income. Should you be paid for those things? Heck yeah, you should. Full value? Yes, you should. Should you be able to convert that to cash and pretend it was income as a way to spike your pension? No. Why? Because there's no money to backstop that. 
It sounded good. It got a lot of people elected and reelected. But it's impossible. This high three, you pay in on what you actually earn. But then you can retire based on the highest three years or five years for some that you've ever earned in your life as a state employee. So you could earn $30,000 a year, but if in your last three years you happen to get a job as an administrator in some public school system or as a judge executive or an appointed person in Frankfurt or some such thing, and now you're making eighty or ninety or $100,000 a year, oh, and you have three you know, decades worth of sick days and vacation days that have piled up and you can roll 30% of the cash value of those in on top of it. Oh, and three years isn't really three years because you can actually take your highest month of employment and multiply that times 12 and that counts as a year, which is why everybody retires August 1st because you get paid three times in July. All of these games that have been played have caused the cost of what people are paying to be way more than there was ability to pay for it. Is the person who's retiring doing something wrong? No. Is there one of us, myself included, that wouldn't take full advantage of every one of these things? Of course not. You'd be crazy not to. That's like saying you get a tax deduction for certain things, but that's all right. I don't want my tax break. Nobody says that. If you're eligible for something and you're a state worker, you should take every one of these things. But the point is, some of them should never have been promised. So the net result of this, if you are paying in, let's just say, quick math, you're a person that says you earn $50,000 a year for 30 years. <coughs> Dial it up or down based on your actual circumstance. But if you earned $50,000 a year for 30 years, you earned $1.5 million over the course of your life working for the state. Let's just stay, say that you put in an average of 10% over the course of those uh, 30 years. Now right now some people are putting in 13 percent, but before that it was nine, before that it was seven, before that it was nothing. So my point is nobody's actually paid 13 over 30 years. Maybe they've paid 10 percent at the most over 30 years. Most haven't even done that. Let's just say that's what it is. So you put in an average of 10 percent over 30 years. You made 50,000 a year. It means you put in five thousand dollars every single year for 30 years. You put away a hundred and fifty thousand dollars, which is a lot of money. People say, well, I better get my money back, back to what I said earlier. In reality, is it your money that you're getting back? Because you're you start working at 30, let's say you start working at 22. You retire 30 years later. You hit your high threes, you hit your 3.0, you hit all these multipliers and different things that some people have the ability to get. You max it out, you start at 22, you retire at 52. The odds of living to 92 are remarkably high. Let's just say you do. So you retire at 52, you live 40 more years, but because of high threes and all these other things that we're talking about, the ability to roll things in, you earn an average of 50. There are not a lot of people in certain systems that are retiring based on these high threes and high fives whose last income for the basis of their retirement is less than what they are earning when they retire. They just aren't. They're, they're using the system as it was designed for them to use it. But let's just say in this case, a person really, even though they were earning 50 on average, let's just say they retire getting a benefit of $40,000 a year. Okay, so $40,000 a year for the rest of their life. They put away again, remember how much? 150,000. And over that 40 years, and let's assume no colas, we're not even counting health insurance. But pretend that's free, it doesn't cost anything, which of course it does. For those that get it, and there's some tier one folks who get it, it's over $5,000 a year and going up of value, but leave all that aside. Let's say you're getting $40,000 a year. $40,000 for those 40 years, you're going to earn $1.6 million in retirement. You earned $1.5 during the years that you worked. You make $1.6 to be retired, and you saved $150,000. In what magical mathematical investment world can you save 150000 and then get $1.6 million from it starting a few years later? And people say, well, hey, I put my money in. True, you did. But if you put in 150000 over 30 years and you make $40,000 a year in retirement, how many years does it take you before you get your money back? Less than four. Less than four. You're still in your 50s. You're in your mid-50s. And you've already gotten all your money back. The other one point. <coughs> 
four, five million, the one and a half million dollars is coming from who? It doesn't exist. It literally doesn't exist. People have told you and everyone else for years that it does, but it doesn't. There's no magic pot of leprechauns that are whipping straw into gold in Kentucky. They don't exist. And this is a hard and painful conversation to have, but we need to have it, which is why these rates are going up. They're going to keep going up. There's no alternative if we actually want the system to be sustained, if we don't want the system to fail. So let me close on this topic, on this. I'll get to your question. I think there's some others. What can we do about it then? Senate Bill 151, which was passed last year and then struck down, and I heard people cheering. They cheering the demise. If it's not replaced with the same thing or then some, the system's over. It's done. And if you're in KERS non-hazardous, two, three, four years, it's done. If you're in KTRS or CERS that are 50-some percent, you might have 10, 12, 15 years before it's done. But if you're still working, you better be saving somewhere else. But if we did 151 again, it promised only two things. Number one, future employees get a different program. You cannot continue to offer future employees the same thing that current and past employees have been offered, or they won't get it, and neither will the people working, and neither will even many of those that are retired and expecting to live more than 10 or 12 or 15 years. So you have to change the structure for future employees. That's number one. Number two, you say that given this reality, it's not going to be paid for by these people. It's not possible. Point 0.8 can't pay for one point whatever. Oh, or point 0.2 in that regard. The point is, it's going to be divided into pieces of 30s. You take the total amount owed, which is about $60 billion of unfunded liability. You break it into 30 pieces. And over the next 30 years, we and our children and our grandchildren suck it up and pay 2 to $3 billion a year every year, which is what I've been doing. And I'm the only governor that's ever done it. And I'm not forced to do it by law. I'm doing it because it's the right thing to do. Others have not done it because they've not been forced to. It would now, Senate Bill 151 said that by law, future governors and legislators have to put that money in whether they want or not. And the Supreme Court struck it down and everyone cheered. That's insane to me. They cheered the only chance they had for the plan to survive. And now there's nothing. The systems are failing and will fail if nothing's done. Our legislature is the only body that can do something about it. They tried. It was shot down. They received a lot of grief. They were protested. They were yelled at. They were sworn at. They were spit on, literally. What do you think their appetite is to go back to the well and do this again? Probably not high. And yet they have to. Because if they don't, all of you who raised your hand are not going to get what you think you're getting. Because the money isn't there. And people say, well, it better come from the taxpayers. Well, yeah, it already is. The same people who say, I better get what's promised to me, are the same people that are mad that kids have old school books. They're the same people that are mad that the roads aren't being cut on the side of the highway as frequently as they would like. They're the same people that are mad that the, the law enforcement officers are driving old cars and have old equipment. They're the same people that are mad that people don't have uh, increases in their pay. And some haven't had increases for years. They're the same people that say, hey, the same pothole just gets bigger and bigger. Nobody's fixing it. Why are all those things happening? People should be mad about those things. They should be concerned about all those things. The reason there's no money for all those things is because it's all going into the pension. And yet it's still not enough. Those raises aren't even enough. They still assume a scenario that's not even that realistic. And to put it into perspective, and this is what people need to understand, because I hear from people say, well, hey, the average X, the average state trooper, the average teacher, the average social worker is only making so much per year. That's true. The average teacher, for example, makes about, in retirement, there's COLAs, leave that aside, there's health insurance, leave that aside, about thirty six, seven, eight thousand dollars $8,000 a year. Not a crazy amount. That's what they get in retirement. But here's what's important. That's the average. That includes those that have been retired for quite some time. If you look at just the last 12 months in KTRS, and KTRS isn't just teachers. There's administrators, superintendents, principals. There's people that are in there that are some of the staff. 
But of all the people in KTRS who have retired in the last 12 months, just the last 12 months, what do you suppose the average annual income is for the rest of their lives? Plus COLAs, plus free health insurance. $62,374 a year. Where's that money gonna come from? Again, these people did not do anything wrong. They did everything that was asked of them. And they are owed what was promised to them, except that it's not there. And it's because of all these things that I mentioned and the ways to, to, to jack things up. 62, none of these people earned $62,374 a year when they were working. Certainly not on average, but they managed with rollovers and, and last year's salaries to make it look like they did because you get the benefit of this over the course of your whole life and then you get paid on that for the rest of your life, which is going to be decades. When these systems were set up, people lived just a few years into retirement before those monies weren't needed anymore. Now they live decades. You can't think about this, $62,374 plus a 1.5% automatic increase every year if you're in that particular plan. Let's just say it's 60 to make the math easy and you live for 40 years, $2.4 million for every single person. That's just the average. There are state retirees, no joke, many of whom earn more than $100,000 a year every year. <coughs> The most I'm aware of is more than $160,000 a year that you're paying for. That this person, who's I think maybe not even 60 yet, is going to make for the rest of his life. Maybe he's over 60 now, I don't know. But my point is that you can, this, the system was never designed for that type of a financial reality. That's why you're paying more. And even with these increases, there's no guarantee the system still doesn't fail. There really isn't. It's just for the first time, no longer pretending the market's going to do something it's not, no longer pretending that this isn't happening. For the first time, KRS is saying we have to look at this reality, not pretend it's doing this. We have to pretend the market isn't going to give us more money than it ever has. It is giving us now. By being realistic about those two, that's why the only thing that can give up, go up, is how much we contribute. And even that, there's no guarantee. The system may fail even in spite of these things we're talking about. But if we don't go to level dollar funding, which is over 30 years paying two to three billion a year, and if we don't change it for future employees, it will fail. There's no way it won't. Yes, sir. My name is Jimmy Bett. I work with small contractors with my 23 years ago, I was working for the state. And I saw employees for the state, 46, 48 years old, retired. And I told myself, I said, how in the world can this keep happening? Can. You know, I wasn't real smart. And I was pretty young, and I thought, there's no way this can be going on. They would tell me that they were gonna, they had to quit because they could make the same amount of money. And then go get another job and keep drawing that same check. Exactly. But anyway. The gig is up. I mean, that, that, had, that went on for a long time. You know, I work for the maintenance department. I have, you know, I have to bid it to get the job. I don't draw attention. But uh, their budget keeps going down, and I understand what the problem is. But uh, you know, with gas prices being low, it looks like we could add a gas tax or something to try to help the maintenance department. So we still got out our highways. We still, I'm one of the guys that cuts the bushes on the side of the road and helps yep. work on slides and drainage. And we still got to have that. And I know they, they deserve their pensions, but uh, they we do. still got to have our roads and our, our right-of-ways taken care of. I agree. And the point is, and I'll repeat some of what he's saying. He's commenting on the fact that he's been working 20-some-odd years now. Maybe how many years has it been? 23. 23 years. And he remembers early on seeing people retiring 46, 7, 8 years old and thinking there's no way this could last. And indeed it can. And now, sadly, we're the suckers that happen to be in elected office when it's all come due. Or appointed office, as the case may be. But we're the ones that are having to be the adults. <coughs> and the question is, what could be done as it relates to road funds and things? Because you still have to repair and fix things and you still need new infrastructure. There's only two sources for highway money. Only two sources. 
One of them is the Federal Highway Trust Fund. That's where Washington gives us money, but it's just a portion of, of our own money and other people's money. We all send money to Washington, gets get put in a pot, gets divvied back up and sent back. So we get about $700 million a year from that pot of money. The only other source we have for road funds is something called the variable excise tax on fuel. And it's about a 9% variable excise tax. It is a 9%. It generates about $700 million as well. It's currently got a floor on it that until we get north of 285 a gallon isn't going to go up. And we're around two bucks a gallon, plus or minus around the state. So calling it two bucks, we're a ways from 285, 95, or three dollars, or whatever it's got to be before we start to see it go up. The only way you can see it go up besides that is to raise that floor with an increase in the variable excise tax, adding another however many pennies per gallon to the price of gas. And his point is, while they're low, isn't that something we should be thinking about? Darn right it is. Because here's the sad reality. Does anybody want to pay more taxes? No. How many of you, and I'm curious, I'm being completely serious. I mean, you all, how many of you in this room have, have ever filled out your own taxes and sent them in in your life? Okay, every, pretty much every adult in here. When you have, how many of you have noticed that little box, and it's probably made you smile, there's a little box on there that you can check and send an extra money to help with the federal debt. Have you all seen that? Okay, how many of you have ever checked that box and sent in extra money? Did you? God bless you. You are the only person I've ever met who's done it. So thank you, sir, for doing that. Seriously. I mean, I'm serious. But my point is this, and I mean it sincerely. I mean, I, there, most people don't. I'll be honest, I have not. I've paid plenty. I've not paid plenty plus. So, but to you who has, thank you. My point is this. Most people don't want to pay more than they are required to pay. They don't. Even when given that opportunity. Even when for a worthy cause, as you noticed, why not? You were blessed to be able to do it, you did it, and you did it because you believed it made a difference, and in some way it did. In some measure, we have the same sort of thing to think about in the state. Everything we want, every county budget, every health department, every retiree need, every infrastructure need, every textbook, every law enforcement piece of equipment, everything is paid for from one source and one source only, the taxpayer's wallet. That's it. 100% of everything we're talking about, 100% of it, the original source of it is the taxpayer. Nobody wants to pay more than they have to pay. But people want certain things. Again, I mean, if we pay for them. This is why it's important that you have people in government who don't waste the money. It is hard to earn money. It is hard to earn that money and see it being taken in taxes. It's even more hard to see that money not being wisely spent. So if we want more money, we're, if we want better roads, we're going to have to pay for them. And so we do, whether we like it or not, want it or not, we need to think about whether or not we should at this time or any time see an increase in certain user fees, including at the pump, to be able to get things that we need and want. Again, the only people that can do this are the legislators. You elect, there's four and a half million of us, we elect 138 people. And those 138 men and women, they're the ones who make these decisions. They're the ones who decide, will we go up or down on this or sideways on that? Will we fund things? Will we ignore things? Will we ask for better participation? I mean, all these decisions are made by our legislators. They have to make this decision. I would encourage you, if you recognize the importance of these things, get in their ear. They ironically respond most to actual phone calls. Believe it or not, in a digital day and age, they don't respond as much to emails or to blast emails. If you make a phone call to their office, literally a little green piece of paper gets stuck on a little wire that sticks up outside their desk. And if they walk out of their office and there's eight little pieces of green paper, they wonder who's calling about what. It's crazy, but in a digital world where everybody has one of these things, the reality is... It's still a, a, a phone call that makes a powerful difference. Or when you see them after church or at the grocery store or at the Cracker Barrel or whatever. I mean, that's get in their ear and tell them these things. You're concerned over the fact that they better address this pension problem. 
and better, better pass some version of 151 or then some to change the structure for future employees. I'm not trying to hurt any future employees. The point is, why lie to somebody about something they're never going to get? Let's give them something they will get. There's the ability to give them defined contribution plans that will actually be far more beneficial to them and they'll actually exist. Don't keep lying about something that hasn't existed for 20 years and we haven't told people the truth. So your point is well taken. I would be supportive of our legislature being responsible, raising monies as they are needed, but I'll tell you what's not going to happen, sadly, and nor probably should it. You're not going to see that single issue put to a vote because nobody, Republican or Democrat, wants to be the one that voted to raise a tax. They're afraid it'll hurt them at, pension, at uh, election time. So the key is it needs to be part of a comprehensive tax policy. And by comprehensive, I mean things go up and things go down, things are eliminated and others are increased. And the net of it all is that the average person, hopefully, is not paying any more and, in fact, may be paying less, ironically, but you spread it wider. You hear about this a lot, people saying this is exempted and that's exempted. There's some truth to that. But the irony is, you know what? How many of you have heard about these last uh, legislative session? There were taxes levied on 17 new services across the state, some of which they realize in hindsight, like nonprofits, maybe that wasn't a good idea. So they're fixing that. But my point is, they levied it on you know, 15 plus uh, things that are going to continue to be there. How many of you have heard about that or heard people complaining about it or complained about it yourself? Okay. But here's the thing. The same people who often say, well, that's crazy, are the same ones who are saying, they're, why are they doing that? They're exempting all these things, and they need to get the money from that. Yeah, there's now 15 to 17 fewer of those things. Those were the things people are talking about. But whenever you take one of them away, people are, oh, not that one. They always assume there's one that's going to stick it to someone besides themselves. You know what the biggest tax expenditures and exemptions are that people talk about, but don't realize they're talking about? Mortgage interest, that's the biggest expenditure. When people talk about all the money that the, that the state doesn't take in that it could take in, the biggest one, mortgage interest, charitable contributions, but people don't want that touched. They don't want fees on any number of things. Heck, I just had to have a bunch of trees taken down, big trees that I couldn't take down myself, like 100-foot trees with 38-inch trunks on them. I don't mind taking trees down. I wasn't going to take that one down. The amount of money I had to pay to have those taken down with cranes and stuff, crazy. And guess what? I had to pay tax on it. I wish I'd taken them down two years ago. <laughs> I didn't. My point is, trust me, no one likes it. But until we widen, broaden the tax base and get more people here paying taxes, <coughs> truth be told, even this pension problem, none of the things I've described, including level dollar funding, is going to be guaranteed to fix it. The only thing that will guarantee we will be able to pay for all the things we need and want, the only thing, is to have more people in Kentucky paying taxes. 75 years ago, I look around this room, there's some people in this room that were born 75 years ago or before. 75 years ago, Tennessee, Indiana, and Kentucky all had the same population, plus or minus a little bit. We were slightly bigger than one of them, population-wise, slightly smaller than the other. We're all the same size geographically. We're all 40,000 square miles, plus or minus a little bit. We're literally three piece in a row, bing, 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 in terms of land mass size. So we're same size, we all abut one another. 75 years ago, we all had about the same population. We actually have better seasons and more arable land and better infrastructure, riverways and roadways and railways than they do. And yet now each of them is between six and seven million people and we're four and a half. Could you imagine if we had two million more people? We got more room for it than they do. We have better quality of life than they do. Imagine if we had two million more people who lived in Kentucky, and if just 30% of them were paying taxes. If you had 600,000 more taxpayers, everything we're talking about, everything, would be taken care of, including our ability with confidence to tell a retiree you're really going to get the check that was promised to you let alone if it's 35 or 40 percent of the people paying taxes. 700 to 800,000 new taxpayers. My goodness, that's the solution. So how do you get there? You've got to create an environment in which you have your financial house in order by being honest with people and paying the bills even when we got to tighten our belts and it stinks. It's no fun to be the people who have to be the adults after the kids have already been making a mess in the, in the 
you know, whatever. I mean, somebody has to come in and clean it up. We're in that stage of cleaning up right now. If we do, a generation from now, there is no state in America that has more upside potential. We have incredible opportunity, but if we don't get our financial house in order, if we don't, as a result of that, then attract business who believes that we're serious about paying our bills because we're using realistic assumptions and numbers, then the business won't come, the jobs won't come, the taxpayers won't be here, our kids will leave, and it becomes a downward slope. We have the worst funded pension in America, and because of it, we have one of the lowest credit ratings of any state in America, and yet we have more upside potential than almost any state, maybe any state, in America. I truly don't know of a state that has more upside potential than us, especially relative to where we are. It's whether or not we're going to be honest about what we have and what we need to do to take advantage of it. So these are the things that I wrestle with. This is what makes the job so fun. But here's the thing. It wasn't expected to be fun. Somebody asked me, is it fun? No, it's not fun. I wish it was. I wish I could tell you it's fun. But I enjoy things like this. I enjoy the opportunity to fight for things that matter, to be able to shoot straight with people on things that need to be shot straight on. And while it isn't, somebody asked, is it easy? A kid asked me that the other day. There's some kids coming through. Is it easy to be the governor? No, it's not easy either. But here's the thing. It's simple. It's remarkably simple. And what I mean by that is, I know what motivates me. I know what my uh, priorities are. I know the Judeo-Christian principles that my decision making is based on. And the application of those, I don't wake up in the morning and say, am I going to do the right thing or the wrong thing? Am I going to do the political thing or the non-political thing? I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to do the simple, right, non-political thing. So it's simple to know what to do, but sometimes the simple is hard. Sometimes the application of what's simple is not easy, and this is such a time when we deal with infrastructure that's crumbling and no money there to fix it, when we deal with a pension system that's crumbling and no money there to fix it. These are the times that try men's souls, as Thomas Paine wrote back in 1775. But I'll tell you what, as he said, it's the summer soldiers and the sun, sun, sunshine patriots that will fade away when times get tough. I appreciate that we have enough people that aren't the summer soldiers and sunshine patriots. We need to suck it up. It's, it's a hard thing. I don't want to say we're getting soft. That might get people worked up. But, you know, but the reality is we can't be soft. We need to suck it up, as my dad used to often tell us when we were kids. But it's true. Other questions on anything? Yes, ma'am. Uh, first of all, I want to say thank you for being pro-life. We're happy that the heartbeat bill just passed the Senate. Yep. And Senate bill uh, nine expecting it to pass the House, so I'm sure you'll sign. <coughs> but I'm here representing uh, a business here in Ohio County. We're a nonprofit, and a uh, portion of our business is an uh, oppor opportunity work center where we employ disabled clients. So we have found ourselves in some financial troubles and in need of some repairs and uh, such other things to our facility. So just looking for resources, uh, someone we can reach out to the state for any grants or any other type of Here's assistance. Here's what I would say. Rebecca Rittenhouse is right in the back, right there in the middle. Um, get with okay. Rebecca. Right. And if there are things available to us through the Department of Local Government, there are sometimes both state and federal dollars available for grants, mm -hmm. specifically based on your needs. I, I'll let, right. We can figure right. that out. I don't know if they would apply, but they might. And if they do, let us help you figure out how to apply for those. Okay. But then also I would say, and I say this to all of you that are in here, elected and unelected, come alongside the organizations in your community that are filling a need. Because frankly, at the end of the day, it's our responsibility. If we think that we can expect government, because we are government, we fund government, as we've been talking about. But we think that now we've saved, paid our taxes, therefore we wash our hands of responsibility in our community for those with disabilities or any other situation, we're better than that. The greatness of America has always been built on better than that. Yes, sir. Governor, I'm J.B. Hines. I'm honored to serve at Ohio County. It's a terrific county to serve. I follow um, retired Judge Renona Browning. I practiced before her and was honored to follow her um, on the bench. One of the issues um, that this community and all the communities of our Commonwealth facing is the issue of substance abuse. 
and I would like uh, you to address what your administration has done to address that particular issue. Sure. I will say this. We'll, we'll, there's a number of things that have been done. They include things like we're the only state in the nation that limits the initial prescription of opioids to three-day supply. That's only just recently gone into a place. It's already starting to have some effect. But it's more than just opioids, this drug problem that we're talking about. We're seeing an increase, a spike in this community and others in methamphetamines, things that seemingly had faded away are now starting to be more prevalent again. And while methamphetamines have actually increased from a fairly small base, nonetheless have increased about 47% in the last year, we've seen actually a decline in the last couple of years in opioid overdoses by over a third, just year on year, actually. So it's in Kentucky, at least. While it's still a big problem nationally, we're seeing some abatement. But on average, between methamphetamines and opioids and fentanyl and carfentanil and heroin and all the other iterations of the above, we are still seeing, at best, a plateauing. And we are not doing well on this front. Every day, about four people in Kentucky declining a little bit, three point some every day, die of an overdose related to some drug abuse. And yet the points you're speaking to are a lot bigger than just those that are dying. There are many who are living, who are living with an abuse disorder, who are abusing drugs, whose families are suffering along with them. You look in our county jails, our local jails, our state prisons, 75, 80, 85 percent or more, depending on the, the actual jail, of the people that are in there, are in there for drug-related uh, issues. You look at our foster care system, we have about 10,000 kids in the foster care system. About 80% of their parents are in jail or on drugs or both. So there's a ripple effect that affects us everywhere. What are some of the things we've done? We've limited the first initial dose of opioids. That's had some effect. It will continue to. We've started programs, don't let them die, dot com, where people can be through public service announcements. We've had 1-800-NUMBERS uh, put in. It's an 833 number. It's 833-8-KY-HELP, I believe. You can double check that. 833-8-KY-H-E-L-P, where people can call and get a live person to help them if they have a person themselves, although it's usually someone on behalf of someone, who calls and says, hey, I need some help for this person. There's a live person to say, no, sorry, there's nothing in your community. Heck, we'll now communicate because we're using technology to do it. There's nothing in your immediate community, but guess what? One county over, three counties over, or maybe eight counties over. There's a bed, there's a facility, there's a place you could call, they could see you right now. We've started something called the Angel Initiative. Now, in every one of our state police uh, barracks and increasingly in some of our other communities as well, there's the ability to come in even if you are strung out, even if you are on drugs. You could even have paraphernalia with you or on you. But you come in and you say, I need help. You will not be criminally charged in that instance for that violation. You will be given help. These are some of the things we've started to do. And it's making a difference, which is why we're seeing a plateauing slash declining <laughs> when in fact much of the nation is still doing this. We're still one of the worst in the nation as a percentage of our population that wrestle with this. So while we may feel good about the fact that it's been this, it's still at a much higher level than even the national average, which may be doing this. We have a long way yet to go. But part of it then comes back to what I was alluding to earlier. And that is, we have a responsibility amongst ourselves. We do, in this community. Every single one of us. I would encourage you, please, there's not one person in this room that's not at least, you know, probably only one degree of separation away from this issue. And so the question is, what are you doing about it? What are you doing to come alongside organizations that are nonprofits in this community, that need volunteers, that need donations? What are you doing to help somebody who you know, you know, I think the father in that house went to jail about two, three years ago, and the mother looks like she's pretty worn out. I, I bet she might be on drugs. I hope she's not on drugs. Those poor kids don't look like they even have a, a winter coat. And yet I see him standing out by the school bus. Boy, I hope somebody does something. I bet you there's not one person in this room that hasn't had that thought go through their head or some variation of it. Did you do anything about it? Seriously. I'm not here to give you all a lecture. I'm talking to myself as much as I am to every one of you. 
But if we assume that someone else is going to take care of it or some government program is going to take care of it, and we see it, ice storm is coming in here. There may be things other, other, unrelated to drugs. There's older people who live in this community, and in 24 hours there may be icy walkways, and you know that there's an 85-year-old widow who lives inside that house. She's not going to get out and clear her pathway or salt it. And you live four houses down and you drive by it, and you bet she's probably going to be stuck in there for two or three days. Why doesn't you or one of your kids or somebody that you know just go down there and say, hey, knock on the door, how are you doing in here? Yeah, Can I take care of your walkway? It sounds like a simple thing. It sounds like I'm trying to ask us to turn into Mayberry. Maybe. Maybe so. This is what America used to do. We took better care of each other. We watched <coughs> out for each other. It started in our own homes. We took care of people. We, our parents raised us to look out for each other. Did we all do it perfectly? Of course not. There's no perfect parent, there's no perfect home. But it was a different sense of responsibility. And if we didn't get it in our home, we might have gotten it at Sunday school, or we might have gotten it in the scouts, or we might have gotten it at school on a sports team, or in a home ec class, or with a teacher who really always said, hey, come in early, stay late, I'll be here, I'll help you out. Every one of us had a teacher like that, somebody who went above and beyond. Where are those people now? They're still out there. What are those of us that aren't those people doing to help those people? Really? This is, this is our community. This is your county. This is our state. These people with drug problems are our friends and neighbors and family. Don't let it be just because it's someone in your immediate family that gets you involved. Intentionally, proactively go out of your way to find the people that aren't in your immediate family right now that you can come alongside and help in some way. This is how we fix these problems. I will say this, and then we'll go to the next question. There's not, if you look at the funnel of addiction, the people that are falling into this funnel of addiction, and there's so many reasons why. There's not enough program. They come into this funnel that's this big, and they fall into a chute like that, and they go down the chute of addiction. At the bottom end, there is literally not enough government programs or government money or even private money and programs to fix all that is broken at the bottom of that funnel. If we do nothing to shrink the size of the top of that funnel, we allow it to continue to get even wider and wider with more and more broken homes. Do you realize there's more children in America now for the first time, last year, for the first time ever, we crossed the threshold that we're not likely to go back over. There are more children in America now living in a home without their biological mother and father in the home with them than children who do. So it is now abnormal it is, no, it is now not normal to live with your biological mother and father. If you live with your biological mother and father, that is no longer normal in America. And yet every study, 100% of them have shown kids who don't grow up in that environment, while that may or may not be a perfect one, kids who don't grow up in that environment are statistically more likely in every bad category to find themselves the substance abusers, the victims of physical abuse, sexual abuse, living in poverty, dropping out of high school, incarcerated, dying of diseases that could have been treated. Ironically, all these things are related in some powerful ways because of the breakdown in the family unit and in the communities. And again, there's no easy one way to fix this. But if we in society, in our families, in our community civic organizations, in our churches, in our elected officials, in our just neighbor to neighbor and loving people like you'd want to be loved, not the way you are, but the way you wish you were, if we all extended some more semblance of that, we'd have a return to more of what we wish we had or think we remember whether it was true or not. This is what we have to do, especially in rural communities where infrastructure and the focus of government doesn't seem to be where we wish it was. We have a responsibility for one another. And so as it relates to the drug issue, we're all over this as much as we can be, but we're limited. We have to shrink the size of the funnel. That's the key. If it stays big and big and big because of broken homes and everything else, and it just keeps getting bigger, there's no amount of ability to fix it at the bottom. You have to make it so that the top of the funnel ends up actually being very small. There's always going to be people who fall into the funnel of addiction. There always have been. But if smaller numbers fall in, it's easier to deal with them at the bottom. 
it's a long, fuzzy way of answering your question, but it's, there's no easy fix to it. But we are making very specific strides in probably as much or more than any state on this because we're affected by it as much or more than any state. Other questions? We've got time for one more. Yes, sir. Sir, my name is Earl Marks. And I'm sorry I held up my hand on the tax issue. <laughs> That's no, I mean, you. I, I made a mistake, so forgive me. I will never do that again. <laughs> but, but I came here today to express my sentiments to you regarding economic development. Uh, I'm an old man. I grew up in this county, and I had my, my last rodeo. Why is to see that broadband technology is available to industry, schools, and people in this county. And we're getting there. Yeah. But Kentucky Wire is not as bad as the pension plan. I don't think anyone, I would say to deal with the pension plan, turn it over to private industry, they'll bankrupt it and start it all over. But. <coughs> That's a little bit sarcastic. But we need your interest and your economic development people's interest in realizing the priorities to make business grow. And in this county alone, you're talking about tax issues and Kentucky retirement. This county collects about probably two million, the judge will know, or his secretary, two million dollars not conventional. When people have a job and they have it 365 days a year, they pay taxes. They don't take taxes. Exactly. So if we grow our infrastructure, and I'm, I'm not giving you a lecture, I'm just saying. No, I agree with everything you're saying. I think you're we, spot on. We, we need your help to nudge Kentucky Wire, the AT&Ts of the world, and when they come and ask you, well, we don't want to run any more copper in Kentucky, that was a good deal. I understood that. But they're not doing anything to earn what they asked for and obtain. So, Your point is well taken. It's interesting. And let me give you some encouragement on this let me, front. Let me, let me just, you know, I'll, I'll, I had this little piece. And oh, sure. Go ahead. I'd like to finish it, please. Some of the programs that your administration has uh, initiated, I think, are A++, plus plus, like your gold fame program where you're taking people who are on poverty payrolls and training them in skills where there is a big job demand. And I know, and you know better than me, the demand in Kentucky for reliable, skilled workers far exceed the supply. And I don't I don't see that catching up. I think robotics will ultimately have to take over because people by nature don't want to work. But I want to ask you, as the current governor of this commonwealth, and as a person who's been in business and been in government, to say the people that drives this are the little small businesses like we have, or this, this county can't operate in the future on coal and corn. And that's been its mainstay. So I say to you, as my governor and hopefully my reappointed governor by the people of Kentucky, if you have an opportunity to make a decision whether you want I 69 or broadband, you take broadband and you'll make this, this state and this county go. Thank you. Thank you. And your, I tell you, I mean, how blessed you are to have somebody in this community who, whether it's your last roadie or not, I, I, just based on your awareness of things and your energy, I'm hoping it's a long rodeo, let's put it that way. Well, I do too. But I, but I will say this, how blessed this community is to have somebody like you who's been an employer but still is as engaged as you are and cares. So let me briefly say a couple things and hopefully encourage you a bit. You're absolutely right. I mean, broadband is, a, is, a, is an internet highway. It's a super highway of a digital sort. And it opens up extraordinary possibilities for any number of things. The Kentucky Wired Project was an absolute mess uh, because it came out of the gate wrong. Just before I became governor, 
$273 million worth of bonds were sold that you all and your kids and grandkids are going to pay for. It was done, the Deputy Secretary of Finance and Administration who signed the contract and rushed it through, then quit his job and appointed himself as the head of the group that was going to spend the money. It was, a, it was a, just a dirty inside job and it shouldn't have happened. Not to dwell on, but he has actually since passed away. It didn't quite work out for him personally the way he thought, but that said, the intent was not good for Kentucky. The net result of it is things were in that contract that didn't demand or expect anything of the AT&Ts or the Appalachian Wireless or the Windstreams or anything else. And in fact, it was predicated on taking contracts away from people that they legally had as a way to provide collateral or justification to pay back the, the, the interest in the bill that was owed on that bond issue. It was just done wrong, straight up. It was a bad deal for the people of Kentucky. And yet, the idea of what wanted to be done was good. To bring broadband to Kentucky was very good and is needed. So the old, you've heard the you know pig in a poke, heck, there was no pig in this poke. We looked in there, there's a few broken parts. So trying to turn that into something, after that, the money had already started to disappear. But the encouragement I want to give you, it is coming, and it's coming well. We didn't even have poll agreements. We didn't have any kind of rights of way. The state should never have signed a contract and or extended this debt out there and sold these bonds before these things were buttoned up, but they did. So how we turn that sow's ear into a silk purse is what we're trying to do. Scott Brinkman, who's my cabinet secretary, is we're so blessed to have somebody like him. And somebody like Bill Landrum, who oversees the finance and administration contracts now. I mean, these two gentlemen, they're extraordinary. These are men who could easily be retired. Scott was a top M&A attorney, former state legislator for 10 years, years ago. Bill Landrum, I met him, he was catering a party at a you know, somebody's home for a fundraiser or something. And I was talking to him, he's bringing out cookies and things. I asked him what he used to do. Well, I'm, you know, I'm retired. What, what did you do? I worked in government. What did you do? Well, I was in the military. What did you do? He turns out he was the undersecretary of the Army and he ran global finance for the entire U.S. Army <coughs> worldwide. He's now the head of finance and administration. Why do I mention this? Because people of that caliber, people with the intellect, the life experience, and the motivations that they have are now in charge of this. And we are, I have, we have 53 different crews in the field right now in Kentucky, pulling wire, that are actually moving with a sense of urgency that was not there. I brought the people at Macquarie who we did this P3 project with, and the top people from Australia in New York, in my office in Frankfurt a few weeks back, a couple months ago now, and had a frank, frank conversation. Very frank about the fact that, and they, our argument was a good one. Hey, we didn't do anything wrong. You all signed the contract. Nobody forced anybody to do it. The state wrote this contract. And we just were party to it. All true. But they knew that we were getting a raw deal. We were willing to give it to them, and so they were happy to take it. But I just said, listen, the point is, you don't want, nor we do we want, the reflection on you to be that this thing doesn't come to fruition. We still have the need. What this has done is light a sense of fire and urgency under the backsides of the subcontractor that they've subbed out to. Because if there's a breach of contract and they lose it, so too do they. Well, they have the capacity to get the job done and they have 52, three uh, teams in the field right now and we are moving with a greater sense of urgency than I ever thought we'd see. It is coming and it's gonna come, I, Lord willing, during your rodeo and the front end of this part of the rodeo, seriously, as in like the next year or two, when it will be complete. Now, it's important to understand what it is. It's not gonna be in every single home, but you have the original trunks and then you have what's called the middle mile. It is the middle mile that brings it into communities, that gives it into the hands of the AT&Ts and the Windstreams and the Appalachian Wireless and the Comcasts and the others that are in and around, some statewide, some regionally. It gives them access that they can then take it and bring it through their networks. It's no longer seeing them as competitors, but seeing them as allies. No longer saying we're going to build a program or a network independent of them. We're going to leverage off, piggyback, and share connectivity with them. And that's a major difference. 
We were assuming that the state was going to build its own broadband to compete with all these others. It was absurd. By the time we would have even been done with it, if we'd been able to do it, it would have been obsolete. Why not partner with people that are already there who have a vested interest? giving them an incentive to continue whether they're required to pull copper anymore or not, to at least pull digital wire and or wireless connectivity. We are doing it, and it's happening just in the last weeks with a remarkable sense of urgency. And this weather, despite the rain, has been mild enough that we've been getting more done this winter than we would have thought. So it's coming, and it's coming, and it's going to be powerful. It really will. And it will open up incredible amounts of opportunity for economic development. I am a business person and I have a sense of urgency. One other thing I'll say to encourage you and the others that are here. If you look at the history of Kentucky, the greatest amount of private capital we ever had invested in our state in any one year ever was $5.1 billion of private capital invested in our state. And that's a good amount for a state our size. That really is. In the last three years, we've had about 18 billion. The two best years, two years ago, 9.2 billion. Last year, 5.3 billion. We have absolutely blown away all those records. Why do they matter? Because when capital expenditures are made, as you know, then people are building buildings. When they build buildings in a community, those get taxed and that goes into our school systems. People work in those buildings and they buy homes and those get taxed and that goes into the school systems. They earn income and that gets taxed and that goes into other needs. They buy gas and that goes into the other needs that we have. So when capital, private capital is invested here, there is a ripple effect that's extraordinary. The fact that we have 18 billion that has been invested here in the last three years, we have well over six billion dollars more in the pipeline right now real active ones and what i do every single day when i'm not doing this is i'm out hustling with companies around this country and around the world to convince them to come to kentucky i'll give you one example there was a company i heard of it's a global company a name you would know they don't want us to mention their name at this point which is fine but they're a, a, a name that's global, they're US based, they're an engineering company. They employ hundreds of thousands of people here, around the world. They have an interest in building a regional engineering hub somewhere in North America, away from the coasts. They have strong presences around the country already. So this would require them potentially moving some people, hiring additional ones. They wanted to know where might they go. I heard about this and I thought, boy, Kentucky would be great. Our quality of life, our cost of living, our proximity to everything, our logistical connectivity, our love of, of the very things that this particular you know, company is involved with, all of these things. I just thought we'd be great. So I had our economic development people look into this and it turns out they already had a short list of eight places around the country. We weren't on it. I thought that's nuts. I'd love to at least be considered. So I went and met with the CEO of this company. And I said, for the following reasons, some of which I just mentioned and many more, I said, I'd love to, could we at least be on the radar screen? He said, I'll tell you what, you know, we'll add you to it. So maybe they were being nice. Now we were one of nine. <coughs> and then they began to go and ask for information and make visits and winnow things down. And this is, they're looking to create 1,000 jobs at an average salary of $127,000 a year. I don't care where in Kentucky you put it. You could put a $100 million payroll into any state that borders Kentucky and Kentucky would benefit from it. But even more so if it's literally in our state. Then they were down to six, we're still in there. Four, we're still in there. Three, they're still in there. It's down to two and we're still in there. We may get this. Why did we get it? Because we're just out hustling. We got the Amazon Prime Air Hub, which is being built in Northern Kentucky right now, because we just out hustled other states. They were not going to come here. I went and met with all of their executives. I've been out to their locations in Seattle. I've met with them. I've spoken at length with them. Even when they said, there's a chance we might, but it's somewhere down the road, I said, what can we do to bring it here now? I gathered all the people in our state that were responsible for everything from the permitting to the legal to the accounting to the roads to the all of it into one room 
And we sat down for an entire day with their top people and we chopped through stuff and we got about 80% of it done. And the other 20% we went out knowing what needed to be done. Amazon said they'd never worked with any state that's ever taken them so seriously or been so business minded. And as a result, they're now building, when they're done with it within the next months, it will be the second largest building in the world. Over 9 million square feet under roof, they're building it right now. They originally announced that they were going to have 2,700 employees and spend one and a half billion to build it. They're going to spend more than that and there will be well over 10,000 employees, maybe as many as 40,000 in time with this intermodal hub that they're going to build here, their primary hub. Why? Because we out-hustled people. Abraham Lincoln, who was born here in Kentucky, is famous for saying many things, as we know. But one of them that he said that I love, that I don't think a lot of people fully even know that he said, he said, good things may come to those who wait, but only the things left behind by those who hustle. And that, I mean, you talk about a true statement. And I will say with all due respect to other governors, there's only one or two that I see hustling to the degree that, that I am, and I don't even think they are which is good for us. I'll tell you in all seriousness, you know who I was very happy left being governor to become a, a you know, an ambassador and now has left that was Nikki Haley in South Carolina because that woman hustled. That was that was some formal competition there. And it's not accidental that South Carolina has seen some of the growth that they've seen. You want a governor that will be out there busting tail for you, but also that will be able to sit down with people at these various places and be taken seriously. And at the end, of, this is what I love. I've built companies, I grew up well below the poverty level. Very rural, very poor, very simple life. But the American dream is a real thing. It is a real thing. It's not just a, something in a storybook. It is real. And I've been blessed to live it. And I've literally started companies that were ideas in my head that are still in existence today that have generated hundreds of millions of dollars in payroll, in taxes, in goods and services being bought and sold. Because you can do that in America. You can be a simple country kid where my literally highlight of my life, until I went off and went to school, joined the military, first time I flew an airplane, I was 17, I won a trip through 4-H. But the highlight of my life to that point, till I graduated from high school, was sleeping in the barn once a year at the county fair with my animals and having the independence to go out on the midway after we were supposed to be asleep in the barn. I mean, literally, that was the life I came from. How blessed am I to have come from that, to be given the opportunities that I've been given, to be able to sit down. I've spoken personally in the last five days with the President of the United States three different times some of which are calls he initiates. He will call me at my house. How, who would have ever thought it? How blessed I am to be able to have the ear of people like that. Secretary Ross, Secretary Perry, the, the head of the Department of Energy. People that have the ability to be helpful to us. How fortunate I am to be given this opportunity by you all, to be able to be able to stand in that gap and try to make a difference. I'm grateful for it. It isn't easy, as we said earlier, but it is simple. And I'm blessed to be able to do it, and I appreciate it. And I appreciate you all being here. I'll continue to hustle. Good things are coming, not only on broadband, but the people that will avail themselves of that. We will get this infrastructure issue taken care of. I will continue. I'm a foot on the gas person. As I said earlier, I don't need or want this job enough to blow smoke at you in order to keep it or in order to have gotten it in the first place. I'll shoot straight with you. I'll continue to take on the hard issues. I'll continue to encourage slash keep a boot in the backside of people to keep them moving in the right directions. You know, there's a certain, some people are motivated with sticks and some with carrots. The key is to figure out which is which and balance them accordingly. It's not always easily done. I'm not the most patient person in the world. I have a sense of urgency, but I'll do it to the best of my ability. I thank you all for giving me that chance and I thank you all for being here. And be careful out there. Good things are coming to this county. They will. And I'll work with both of you.